Hello everyone and welcome to Net Zero Week, brought to you by YPO and iNetwork. I'm Ian Reid, Fleet Category Manager from YPO, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar titled Decarbonising Transport and Logistics. The session will focus on how transport and logistics have changed and will continue to change in support of Net Zero Carbon Agenda. I'm delighted to be joined today by our guest speakers, Simon Ralph, Chief Executive Officer Telematicus, Peter Eggman, Program Manager Fleet Energy Savings Trust, and Neil Hind, Northwest PPE and Sustainable Procurement Lead, NHS England and NHS Improvement. Just a couple of housekeeping items to mention before we start. As you can see, there is a chat box on the side of your screen where you can submit any questions you might have for the panel. We will try to answer at the end of the session. Depending on how many questions there are, we might not have time to answer them all, but we will follow them up on email after Net Zero Week. You can also use the menu icon at the top left of your screen to navigate back to the event agenda where you can see all upcoming webinars. If you want to register for any more webinars, please follow the link at the bottom of your screen. I'd like to kick off today's session with a 10 minute presentation from each speaker. Simon, could I ask you to start us off, please? Good morning. I'm delighted to join you at this YPO Net Zero Week. And in particular, talking to you today around the decarbonisation of transport and logistics emissions. Before I talk to you about the insights that we've gained in working with organisations on their journey to net zero and the trends that we're seeing, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Telematicus. We're a software and solutions company and we focus on helping organisations make the best moves with their data. Primarily, our focus is driving risks and increasingly driving risks associated with emissions. So in terms of the trends and insights that we're seeing, then one of the big things is everybody setting goals and targets. And there are a plethora of them out there, whether it be 2050, 2040, 2035. And one of the things that we're finding is that those organizations that wrap um, a framework around those goals and targets have found that that is a more successful approach. Just declaring climate emergency or saying that we will be net zero by 2035 uh, is just taking one thing into consideration. And of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, there are about seven that are related to transport emissions and decarbonisation. The two we particularly focus around are three, which is good health and well-being, and that covers things like driving accidents, um, but also things like air quality. And then of course, number 13 is all around climate action and reduction of emissions. What is fascinating is that of those organizations that do set goals, then less than 10% of them have actually set interim goals and targets. And so what we find is that helping organizations set the big goals, but more importantly, the interim goals is important from a business planning point of view. If you've got a 10 year business plan, you'll have a five year business plan, a three year business plan, a one year plan. And we think the same should apply to emissions. The next big area is data. And we see a trend whereby organizations are moving away from just purely reporting and are focusing more on providing semi real time data. And uh, the mode of operation that we tend to advise clients is 
you think about emissions data in the same way that you would look at expenses. Expenses are reported at the end of the trip, at the end of the week, at the end of the month. And emissions data should be treated in exactly the same way. Um, and the old adage, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, manage it is true. Another area we're seeing is that as people get more and more involved in terms of understanding uh, about their plans is circularity, which then takes into consideration the whole product life. And if we take into consideration things like electric vehicles, then the manufacturing of electric vehicles does raise some challenges, not least the volume of precious metals used in the manufacture of them, and even the size of batteries. Talking to a partner recently, then uh, he was talking about what's happening in Asia, where things like hydrogen vehicles are starting to hit the road. Um, now, in all of these cases, this does rely on having a robust infrastructure. So what it drives potentially is the idea that you have a blended approach. The next area that we help organizations with is to understand where their emissions come from. And there are fundamentally three areas. Uh, the first area which you'll all be familiar with is scope one. So that's direct emissions from your fleet, including your gray fleet. Um, and that area is fairly sort of well-defined and you will have already been reporting to DEFRA and governments in terms of how you're progressing on that basis. The challenge tends to come with things like the Grey Fleet. Uh, recently, a client of ours identified 100 vehicles that fell into this category. Scope 2 emissions are not normally associated with transport and logistics uh, because they're the emissions that come from buildings, electricity, gas. But if your fleet moves towards being EVs or even hybrids, then the electric uh, scope electric uh, is comes into scope two. And the area that really interests us that we're working with clients about to understand is the scope three emissions. And these are the direct indirect emissions that come from the supply chain, staff travel to work and business travel. Talking to a local council, then they realized that actually staff travel to work was a huge element. And in fact, there are stats out there that say that the scope three emissions are 11 times the amount of internal emissions. And it's great that an organization as, such as YPO, which is a purchasing organization who manage the supply chain for, for you are actually raising the profile during this net zero week. And the final thing that we find that organizations uh, look at once they get into the detail is that they may not actually achieve net zero uh, because they still need to run their fleets. They still need to have their supply chains. And so increasingly what organizations are looking at doing is saying, well, once we've understood the data and a baseline of the data, how can we go carbon neutral on the journey? And we work with uh, an organization that enables companies to get UN backed gold certificates for environmental projects, so uh, biodiversity, economic projects like solar farms, and also social projects like schools and farming and this is a really really good way uh, of actually feeding back to your employees um, how you are progressing uh, in terms of reducing your carbon emissions so in terms of capturing the data then there are a number of options out there um, in terms of YPO, then YPO DPS 750 includes the solution that we have developed called Smart Green Drivers. 
And as I've alluded to already, it is very much a journey. So we have an approach, structured approach to help organizations achieve their goals and manage their journey. Um, we use a smartphone based application to collect data and feedback data on an individual basis, as well as providing data on a local authority or council basis in terms of your goals um, on an individual level based on smart, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals and the overall progress. The words that we like to use are take action today to deliver tomorrow's results. And bearing in mind it's a journey, we allow people to start small in terms of taking action around eco driving and then progress to a carbon strategy. So in conclusion, uh, I'd like to say thank you for listening. Um, but also, uh, whenever I attend one of these presentations or webinars, it's always good to actually take something away. I hope you've taken something away in terms of the words, but in terms of practically, then very welcome for you to download our Optio application, which is available in the iOS store or Android, and you can try the application. It's in try before you buy mode. So it'll collect data for 500 miles uh, and then stop collecting data. If you put in the account code YPO net zero when you register, and if you put in your vehicle registration number in the My Garage tile of the app, then that will automatically collect your CO2 emissions and give you feedback on a trip by trip basis. And at the end of the 500 miles, you will get feedback on your driver risk classification using our latest AI model. Just like to say that we are a Microsoft Gold Partner and we're delighted to be part of Microsoft's global campaign, hashtag build for 2030, where they wanted to promote solutions and ideas that picked up on the UN Sustainable Development Goals and helped organizations on their journey to net zero. I will be joining the Q&A session later, but my contact details are on screen, so please don't hesitate to contact me, or alternatively, you can visit our websites or the Smart Green Drivers listing in the Microsoft Store. Once again, thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the sessions. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Peter Regerman. I'm the program manager from the fleet support function at Energy Saving Trust. And this afternoon, I'm going to be taking you through the process of uh, how to transition to uh, lower and, in fact, zero emission transport. But the background is saving trust. We were incorporated back in 1992. Uh, we're an independent organization, and our mission is, to, is that we are working to address the climate emergency. We have registered members. We don't have shareholders. Therefore, if we do make a surplus in any particular financial year, uh, no one gets paid a dividend or anything like that. We just plow the surplus back into our core activities, which is, like I say, addressing the climate emergency. Uh, we're independent, we're impartial, and we're pragmatic. Uh, we're not um, owned by any vehicle manufacturers, leasing companies, energy suppliers, charge point stores, or anything like that. We are, as I say, an independent organization. The background to all of this, the transition to zero emission uh, transport, is that the UK has a net zero carbon emissions target of 2050. Uh, there's recently been a consultation, which has been and gone, on the end of sales of internal combustion engine vehicles, or ICEs, as we often call them. Uh, that is due to happen in 2030. So as of that date, uh, you won't be able to go and buy or lease a new car, sorry, a new diesel or petrol uh, vehicle. Uh, that's certainly relevant, relevant for cars and vans, I should say. Uh, transport is responsible for about 34% of the UK carbon emissions. Uh, I've taken that statistic from 
2019's figures, and that was published in the uh, BEIS website, uh, 26th of March this year. Uh, the IPCC, that's the Independent Panel for Climate Change, I think that's right, can't remember it off the top of my head, has set a one and a half degree uh, temperature increase limit that's over and above the um, Paris uh, summit. And so that forms part of this decision for us to have a 2050 net zero carbon. Act the Energy Saving Trust. When we talk to organisations who run vehicles, uh, we look at these as being the main steps, really. Uh, we consult with organisations that run fleets of vehicles and we gather metrics or data from them. So we look at the fleet the organisation runs. And if you look at these stages, number two mentions assessing vehicles. So we look at the types of vehicles, cars, vans, heavy commercial vehicles, refuse trucks, and so on. And then we look at understanding what the costs are, that's step three on this image, uh, the costs to the organization of running those existing vehicles, but also running the uh, zero emission replacement vehicles. So under, you know, how do the whole life costs look from uh, one fuel source to another? We also help the organization to understand any operational considerations. So in other words, uh, on step four, that's looking at um, uh, does the vehicle have a suitable, is it a commercial vehicle, does it have a suitable payload? Uh, is the gross vehicle weight gonna be a problem? That kind of thing. And then the final step we think here is uh, making sure that the drivers of the vehicles actually uh, accept and understand the need to change, but also that um, they, buy into the whole process of uh, zero emission vehicles, uh, driving them, getting used to them, that kind of thing. A uh, bit of background on funding here. We often get asked this. Uh, vehicles do have some funding available. So in other words, if you choose a um, a plug-in plug battery electric vehicle, whether it's a car, van, or a heavy commercial vehicle, there is a grant available. Um, the grant funding gets topped up from time to time by the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles. And um, there is a uh, grant currently available on cars up to a retail price limit of £35,000. There's a two-step grant available on vans. And um, there is also a grant available on heavy commercial vehicles as well. Uh, there is a grant available, oh, I should stress, sorry, whether you lease or purchase your vehicle, the grant is normally um, obtained by the supplying dealer uh, or leasing company if you lease the vehicles so that you're not involved in any um, admin uh, you know, legwork, that kind of thing. So in other words, in, in most cases, that will be done uh, for you. Please check that when you order. The Electric Vehicle Home Charge Scheme allocates a grant on charge points that are installed at home. Again, as long as you ch uh, choose a for zero emission vehicle approved installer, they will just net that figure off on your invoice. So that, again, you don't really actually have to do anything. Uh, there's also the on street residential charge point scheme. That's more for local authorities wishing to put points in public places, not necessarily on streets, could be in a car sort of thing. And there's some funding available there for the charge points. There's also the workplace charging scheme. In other words, if you are an employer, you're putting in charge points at your depots and so on. Um, there is a grant available to contribute towards that cost. Again, an OZEP approved installer will net that off on the uh, invoice that you receive for that installation. Uh, moving on, here are some pictures of some electric cars. Uh, there's a whole selection there from the smallest being something like the Renault Zoe to the largest being the Mercedes EQC. That is just a selection, not meant to be a descriptive list. There's some commercial vehicles, the Renault Kangoo, Nissan EMV 200, uh, an LDV, the small one, and a Renault Master. They've been around, three of those four have been around for a while now. There's some new ones coming. 
Uh, these are all those pictures of vehicles in the three point, just under three point one ton or up to three and a half ton range. Um, uh, they're, they're they're on sale now, or some of them are coming soon. Uh, this slide here is designed to give you an idea of people actually ordering vehicles. I've taken this from Fleet News this week. DPD, which uh, delivery firm, has ordered 750 Maxus uh, E-Deliver 9s and E-Deliver 3s. So the E-Deliver 9 is the bigger vehicle, and they're looking to increase their pure electric fleet. Obviously, that's a large business, a large fleet in the private sector. Uh, SMEs are keen to make the switch, so the AA, and that's sort of again from a report from Fleet News this week. Uh, and most says there are a lot of SMEs uh, wishing to switch from diesel and petrol over to um, electric vehicles. And that report from the AA says that uh, more than 70% of drivers prefer to drive electric vehicles, probably because the benefit in kind tax is so low now. But local authorities are also uh, getting into the act as well. Here's an example. This is from other local authority publications, again, very recent. Kirkley's Council uh, over in West Yorkshire have just added 25 electric vehicles to their homes and neighbourhoods fleet in their attempt to uh, address climate emergency. At the other end of the scale, uh, we've got some electric commercial vehicles here. A few Zoe Canter. I think the top right one might be a Renault now. Uh, refuse collection vehicles, that's a 26 ton refuse collection vehicle, a very standard looking vehicle. Um, terrible emissions from those things, they do typically three miles to the gallon. Um, that's not the fault of the operators, it's just the way, it's the, it's the role that the vehicles do, it's what they actually um, are engaged in. Uh, there's a lot of electrification of those now, a number of authorities have adopted them, Manchester, Nottingham, Westminster, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, they are expensive to buy and lease. Having said that, if you operate them for a long period of time, uh, you will make cost savings on them. Uh, you should make cost savings on them. And um, the carbon savings are massive. Uh, we would always recommend telematics in uh, commercial vehicles, especially electric ones. This is a recent item from Commercial Fleet News. Uh, Mars Law is the company here. Uh, there are lots of telematic suppliers. They are one of them. They've got a product that uh, helps you to identify the vehicles that could be transitioned from internal combustion to electric. Uh, and that's just one example of the kind of um, option that's available through the YPO framework. And uh, we would always recommend that when you choose your supplier for telematics, you um, ensure that the CAN bus within the vehicle can feed information into the telematic unit that tells you how much electricity is actually being used, because that is a very important thing uh, with um, commercial vehicles in, in the context of top-up charging, which is a, a strong feature in electric vehicle operation. And finally, what we would recommend that you do here is that once you get to the point where you're selecting your electric vehicle to replace your existing ICE vehicle, the things that you need to think about is, is the vehicle suitable in terms of its uh, physical size and what you're, um, what you're ordering that vehicle for? Um, think about your charge point infrastructure. In other words, where are your charge points going to go? Have you got a supplier lined up yet? Try and find out the um, lead times for installations, that kind of thing. And remember, of course, that YPO uh, have a whole uh, section on their um, offering for charge point infrastructure. Uh, we would recommend uh, battery electric vehicle driver training. Uh, if you're going to get the best out of these things in terms of the drivers driving them, not crashing them, uh, getting your carbon emissions saving and um, your whole life cost savings, we would recommend driver training. On our website, if you just go onto our website, est.org.uk, and in the search option, type in uh, electric vehicle driver training or just driver training, you'll come to a section that gives you some information on um, how to arrange some of that. Uh, we would suggest uh, the telematics, especially in commercial vehicles, is a good option if you don't already use it, but make sure that your supplier can uh, uh, assist you with um, identifying the energy usage uh, for each vehicle. 
Uh, we would always suggest fuel cards, again, because it can help you to identify the amount of energy that's being used. Uh, All Star is a dominant and Pippa. Other uh, fuel cards are available, and I'm sure they're on the YPO framework. Um, the, those uh, fuel car providers are getting very much up to speed now on accommodating electric vehicle charging. And finally, there, well, apart from my email address, uh, I've just closed it on you know the frameworks that YPO uh, have in place should be able to assist you in most of the things that we've covered off in this brief presentation. So thank you very much. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about sustainable transport in the NHS, um, what, what this means, what we're doing and um, how ambitious we really need, need to be. So just a bit of bit of background for those who are not aware of where the NHS is. So there was a climate emergency declared by the NHS in Greater Manchester in 2019. And um, on the back of that, every NHS organisation has looked to have, have a sustainable development management plan on how they're going to be, um, how they are going to address the carbon, carbon agenda. And we set up a number of groups. So we've got groups to look at waste, fleet, estates, energy, logistics, theatre gases, inhalers, and um, other areas such, such as such as theatres. And I'm sure there'll be more groups added um, as we look at further um, further topics. Really, helpfully, there was a, a net zero um, document published by NHS England last October that really gave a bit of di direction and some of the some of the facts around what the ambition was going to be and the main aim is that NHS becomes the world's first net zero national health service uh, with targets of 2040 for direct spend and then 2045 for the uh, further spend it can in influence. So where does transport fit in with this? So approximately 3.5 percent, uh, that's 9.5 billion miles of all road travel in England relates to patient visitors, staff and supplies to the NHS. So we've got a big part to play and travel and transport contributes around 14% of the NHS total emissions. So again, quite a big, big chunk to go at. And to help the NHS do this, a number of our programmes have now been set up, um, both at NHS England nationally, NHS um, England Northwest, and here in Greater Manchester as well. So why is this important? Um, so it's reported that around 30% of preventable deaths in England are due to um, non-communicable diseases such as um, air pollution. So the impact that we have on um, on you know, air quality is absolutely massive. And you can see there in the, in the graph, um, just by reducing it by a very small amount, we can we can avoid you know so many um, so so many new new cases of um, heart, heart disease, stroke, asthma, etc., etc. et cetera. And you can see here at the bottom, you know, some examples of what the short term effects are and long term effects. And these all have an impact on the NHS system, going to GP, going to A&E, etc. And over here on the right, you can see where these emissions fit in. Um, and you can see the breakdown, you know, you've got 4% here on the business, business travel, patient travel 5%, visitor travel 4%, 1% for everything else. And you've got the you know other 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 supply chain transport and logistics built into there as well. So we've got a number of projects underway um, in NHS and Greater Manchester and also wider um, to, to start to look at how we can actually bring down some of those figures. Obviously, reduced patient travel is is a massive one, and under under the last um, fourteen months or so during COVID. We've seen some really big improvements in um, in in this area. So obviously, a, a lot more video and telephone consultations are now being undertaken by GPs, by by consultants. Not always possible, but it's for a huge amount of um, of, of cases. There's already been quite a lot of research done uh, and pilots done, and examples of remote remote monitoring, and I expect to see a lot more of that here. In, in Manchester, um, you know, there is now ways to ways to monitor people who have had heart issues 
and and to diagnose and report when they may be maybe an issue that then they do need to go back in for a, a, a further checkup. And more localised treatment options as well. Do people have to go into an A and E into a hospital? Is there more that can be done out there, out there in the system? That will all help reduce um, patient travel. There's obviously quite a lot we can do around business travel as well, and uh, salary sacrifice is is there is there for NHS NHS employees. So um, there is agreement now that we'll only look to use ultra low electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles um, and restrict the types of vehicles that staff can have. That is now being being looked at. As, as organisations um, uh, ongoing now only purchase, again, ultra low or zero emission vehicles as part of fleet. And obviously they, they don't always exist. They don't, some vehicles that we need don't exist. Um, so we need to pilot uh, some of the more specialist um, electric vans, <clears throat> We've got a funding bid at the moment for HGVs, and obviously there's lots of other larger vehicles. You can see uh, a prototype there at, 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 at electric ambulance that is being looked at. Um, the, you know these are being built now, and you know, and you'll start start see examples of these and some prototypes on the road very soon. Interesting fact there at the bottom, talking to NHS fleet 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 solutions, their order books on in April show. We are we are getting there with this, you know. A, a massive amount of the vehicles we we are buying are already in that ultra low ultra low category. Um, Seventy eight percent in total, forty six percent a battery and thirty two hybrid, which is a lot higher than the than the UK average, which is only looking at seven percent at the moment on the battery vehicles. Some other projects we're looking at, supplies and logistics, we um, did business case looking at, can we do a consolidation center for incoming orders with us doing uh, a last mile service, the business, care, business case is there for that, that we, we need to look at now in a bit, bit more detail. Cargo bikes um, are being trialed in Greater Manchester, are being used already in the Northeast very successfully. So we, we can look to uh, simulate what they've already done up there. Can we reduce the number of orders that we that we make? Uh, we've got some work underway now. We're looking at ordering practices and consolidation. Um, it can be for some teams that there's a habit of ordering every day for what they need the next day or a few days afterwards. But can we be you now a bit smarter and put systems in place so the order wants, which will obviously not, which will obviously have a big reduction in the, the packaging and waste, but also could be less vehicles going on to the NHS estate as well. And we need to start to think about when we have the retender for some of the items that we buy. Can we um, start to put a more of a focus on, you know, how these vehicles, um, how these items come into sites and the packaging, um, and is there more sort of innovation we can have to bring there? Um, a very important one as well, looking at how our, our how our staff and also the, and, the, and also our, our visitors get onto site um, as part of the um, NHS Green Plan. Um, every trust should have a cycle cycle to work lead um, and lots of organizations are already on with this and also have a uh, ha have a uh, salary sacrifice scheme as well for for bikes and e-bikes that will encourage more I think to move to move on to active travel and you know we need to have the infrastructure that can help um, secure bicycle and bicycle storage or way that people can can actually recharge their e-bikes um, you know, is it easy for them to actually store the bikes and is it safe as well? So just wanted to really end on a, a, a case study and a big thank you to the team at Manchester University Foundation Trust who have helped with, with these figures. You can see there, um, you know, where the emissions, emissions actually come from for them. Obviously, uh, staff is half, patients and visitors are a good chunk. And then you've got a bit of of um, fleet transport in there and business business travel as well. And really interestingly, you can see how their active travel um, agenda has actually changed over over recent years. And some of this will be influenced by by COVID last year, when there was less vehicles on on the road, and probably less of a of an urge to go on public transport. But it shows you know what can be done. 
So you've seen, you know, a big increase in active travel, uh, a drop on public public transport, but you could see there was a drop between 2018 as well as 2019. And the private vehicle usage has, has been fairly static. So it shows, you know, there is, there is more work to be done there. And we need to try and keep those who have moved to active travel um, still still going on to any NHS estates on that way. What we also want to, what we've also done is looked at the um, the salary sacrifice figures so where people have taken vehicles, what that split is. Um, and you can see still a big chunk of petrol, but a quite a good number of electric and plug-in hybrids and and to a lesser extent normal hybrid only, and only a small amount of diesel. And their estimation is about 42% of vehicles are uh, under the 50 gram figure and 47% under the 75 gram figure. So a good base for them to actually build on um, and, the rest of the, and the rest of the NHS in the region. That was it, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your presentations, which I found really interesting, and I'm sure the audience did too. It's now time for a few questions, and I'd like to start with you, Peter. Um, Peter, we have a question um, for you. It's regarding the end of sale on diesel and petrol vehicles from 2030. That could be just two replacement cycles away. Um, do you think that manufacturers and the public are ready for the change? Uh, yeah, thanks, Ian. I think um, what we've noticed uh, just recently, um, last six months or so, is that the the number of um, electric vehicles being ordered uh, has increased quite dramatically. And that's a combination of um, plug-in hybrid and um, zero emission battery electric vehicles. So. Some of that will be corporate uh, orders, in other words, company cars, and some of that will be retail orders. So um, it appears that uh, the public are getting into, into, into tune with this, and the, the, the number of orders is going up dramatically all the time as, as diesel suffers uh, and petrol as well. So it would appear that people are uh, getting the message, and, um, and that's only now, and we're not even in 2022 yet, so we've still got a few years. Oh. Okay. Um, it looks like I'm, I'm singling you out here, but I think this one's directed at you as well. Um, we have a limited fleet, but it's primarily minibuses. The EV minibus market appears limited and expensive. Can you suggest anything as we look to replace them? Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Ian. Uh, that's, uh, that is a difficult question. and. Um, up until now, the, the motor manufacturers have um, concentrated their efforts on, on cars to start with uh, and light commercial vehicles, vans in other words. Um, the minibuses are an offshoot of uh, either three and a half tonne gross vehicle weight vans or even heavier light commercials, sorry, heavier commercials up to about five tonnes. And the issue that the manufacturers have got is that um, these are, it's quite a specialist market, it's quite a specialist sector, sector sorry, of uh, vehicle sales. So because there's not a massive demand for them compared to the numbers of cars, vans, uh, cars and vans that are sold, it's sort of harder for them to justify uh, putting the um, resource into producing uh, electric minibuses there are vehicles available. Um, they are quite expensive uh, to buy or lease at the moment. Uh, we hope that the cost of running them, sorry, acquiring them, uh, whether you lease or buy, will reduce in time. A lot of them, of course, are conversions. So you, you start off with a van and then it gets converted, or you start off with a chassis car and it gets converted, that kind of thing. Um, so they're not necessarily always produced by the actual manufacturer themselves, combination of efforts. Um, there are organisations that run them. Nottingham City Council runs some um, uh, LDV, EV80 minibuses, and you know other products are available. There are nine-seat 
uh, electric minibuses available from some of the conversion specialists. Um, but of course, that's nine seats, so it's not 17. Um, uh, in other words, not a larger minibus. Uh, it's difficult. I expect that we will get there in time, um, but it's one of those hard to electrify uh, sectors right now. What about you, Neil? You got any any experience within the NHS of uh, minibus operations? No, not yet. It is, it is one of the areas we are starting to look at the passenger transport um, side, which you know which we would definitely fit into that that category. And now there's quite a lot of work going on uh, to Yorkshire Ambulance um, Service, who are probably slightly ahead of their thinking on 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 some of the others. Um, but no, early thinking, and I think like everyone else, probably just waiting to see how the market forms on this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got one more question for you. So uh, we are changing ice cars and small vans with EVs as quickly as possible. For hard to decarbonize yeah. vehicles like high panel vans, four by fours, heavy plant, while the EV tech matures, we are proposing the use of renewable diesel atrio for the interim period. Is there anything else to consider? I think um, we do come across uh, organisations that are trialling or indeed using HVO. Um, it's, and I can understand why organisations use it. Uh, we tend to we tend to advocate uh, battery electric vehicles not because we're biased towards them, just because they are an advanced form of technology and. Um, uh, in particular, with if you take refuse collection vehicles, we advocate electrifying those rather than going to HVO first. Um, but there are other vehicles where we can't suggest that because there is uh, no alternative. Um, and yeah, sure, uh, pickup trucks in particular, you know, proper four-wheel drive pickup tr trucks are difficult. Uh, there are one or two products on the horizon, but. Um, uh, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult sector. There is some decarbonisation of diesel going on as as the uh, increased blending of biofuel into diesel takes place at the pumps, um, but you know that's only a, a, a relatively small percentage of the of the actual diesel that goes in. So it's it's not something that's particularly easy to do right now. Um, Simon, do you have an opinion on that at all? It's a difficult one. Uh, no, no direct experience, Peter. But you know, I think one of the comments um, that you made is, you, I think you've got to consider the circularity in terms of where this, that where these fuels are coming from, how they're made, and take them into the whole context, and then also, you know, how they're being disposed of. So I think it's. It's it's one of those tough ones, but I think you should need just need to take the thing in the round. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. That's all the questions that we've had today. So um, I'd like to thank all the panelists for participating. Um, and if anybody uh, thinks of any questions um, after this event, we will be following up all questions after Net Zero Week. I would like to thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.